This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. One out of every four deaths, basically, in the U.S. and the U.K. are from heart disease. Uh, so it's basically the number one killer, not just in the industrialized world, uh, and a major source of cost, the burdening our healthcare system, but also in, uh, around the world, including in the developing world, that heart disease and its more insidious form of it, atherosclerosis, is the source of, say, every three out of 10 deaths around the world today. So it's so familiar to us that the obvious question is, well, is atherosclerosis really um, a universal aspect of just human aging? It's sort of an inevitable aspect. By the time you're 20, you probably already have some of the fatty streaks that will later go on to become more complicated lesions and create problems for us, or is that not the case? And so maybe atherosclerosis is some, the process is universal, but Maybe it does or does not always present clinical manifestations that will affect our morbidity and ultimately mortality. So a standard kind of story is that if we could zoom back into the past and look at uh, hunter-gatherers, that hunter-gatherers wouldn't have these types of uh, heart disease or other types of problems, and that it's modern features of our lifestyle that is making us ill, that there's a mismatch between our genetic adaptations and modern features of lifestyle. So changes in our nutrition, our diet, uh, our physical activity, our bad habits, as Barbara said, like cigarette smoking and alcohol consumption, that these are maybe what create the problem, and that hunter-gatherers would have little or no coronary heart disease. Uh, and the evidence for this is often uh, focused on some risk factors, so cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, um, low prevalence, that, that their risk factors seem to suggest uh, a healthy heart. But there's some problems here, is that we don't really know uh, that in these types of populations that heart disease is fairly absent. There could be, first of all, the numbers are fairly small. And often uh, there'd be a medical team like in the 1950s or 60s that would sweep through a village, but fairly quickly. And so uh, you might not, have, it could be that people who have heart disease die fairly quickly from it. And so unless you've spent a long time in an area, you might not actually see the real cases if the case fatality rate is quite high. And it could be that, you know, the, and those people get weeded out of the population early. And so if you looked at people over the age of 60, no one has heart disease, maybe because they died earlier on in life. But also, the assessment is fairly indirect. As I mentioned, you know, you can, it's easy to kind of take someone's blood pressure to, to measure how much cholesterol they have, to measure their BMI but it's much harder to get a direct assessment. And of course, if certain risk factors work differently in different human populations, then it might not be a one-to-one -one relationship that the risk factors tell you about the actual underlying 
uh, heart disease. And one good example, from the 70s, it was kind of it became established fact almost that, that, uh, that the Inuit up in the Arctic North, uh, in Alaska and Greenland in particular, that they don't have uh, atherosclerosis and they don't have heart disease, and that in particularly their marine-rich diet, uh, and particularly omega-3s, was one good reason why, uh, despite a very meat-based diet, that they would um, not have heart disease. But it actually turns out there was some unreliable mortality statistics that some of those earlier inferences were based on, and further kind of x-ray and ultrasound studies actually show the opposite, that there is quite a decent amount of atherosclerosis, uh, and that heart disease didn't really look that different from uh, near surrounding populations, and that stroke might even be higher. Uh, and also more recent meta-analyses show no effect of omega-3 fish oils on heart-related deaths, uh, heart attacks, and strokes. So the standard story is actually a little bit different when you look into it in more detail. And also, uh, the Horus group, which we'll see a little bit more uh, further in the talk, looked at a unique sample of 137 mummies across four world regions. So ancient Egypt, ancient Peru, the southwest of the US, uh, and the Aleutian Islands, and across 4,000 years of history, and they looked at different arterial beds for evidence of calcification. So a more direct measure using CT scans, whole body CT scans of these mummies. So for example, here you've got, these are both uh, two uh, Unangan women from the Aleutian Islands. Up here is a woman about 50, here a woman about 30, and you can see some evidence of calcification. Uh, in the aortic arch up at the top, and in the carotid artery down here on the bottom. And what they found was evidence of calcification across all arterial beds, across all four populations. And so they argued that their conclusion was that we found that heart disease is a serial killer that has been stalking mankind for thousands of years. The presence of atherosclerosis in pre-modern human beings suggests that the disease is an inherent component of human aging and not characteristic of any specific diet or lifestyle. Now, the paleo diet people hated this, right, because they were basically saying, look, it's all over. It doesn't matter what you eat. We find evidence of this everywhere. Uh, but of course, all the mummies have been long dead, so it's hard to know what they actually died of and whether that atherosclerosis might have been relevant to their daily lives. Uh, now, also, uh, free riding off of Ajit's talk, uh, we now know that chimpanzees, while the number one cause of death in captives uh, is heart attacks, it's not exactly coming from the same etiology as, uh, as human heart attacks. That chimpanzees do not seem to have the same kind of atherosclerosis. The coronary artery disease is rare, uh, but the heart failure instead is through this diffuse interstitial myocardial fibrosis. Uh, often triggered by arrhythmias. You can see the, the diffuse kind of uh, fibrosis in the heart tissue in chimpanzees, the kind of uh, subendothelial uh, plaques in the, in the human interior lumen, uh, that this is very different. And in captive chimpanzees, despite the fact that they have higher cholesterol levels, they're homozygous for uh, alleles in the APOE4 that are uh, risk, higher risk of atherosclerosis in humans and less physical activity. So quite remarkable difference. So now the standard kind of evolutionary story uh, brought to us by some evolutionary biologists uh, made critical foundational contributions, Medawar, um, uh, as well as uh, Haldane and, and Hamilton, that basically that the force of selection declines with age as fertility is dropping. And so the relative contributions for future generations are, are declining. And so you can have uh, mutations that exert effects late in life that might be somewhat blind to the, the effects of natural selection, especially if they have beneficial effects early in life. So what that means is that you've got deleterious effects that manifest, say, later in life fall under the selection shadow. And it actually turns out, when you actually look at the cases, this is from uh, US data, the actual incidence of heart attacks and fatal coronary heart disease, that those cases do fall into this uh, selection shadow. So one kind of knee-jerk response is, well, maybe, again, these things have always been with us. But uh, in hunter-gatherers, if you're not going to live to this kind of age range, then you're not going to see these types of ailments. And so that might be the end of story, and that our longer lives in modern society is why we see so much more of it today.
But that doesn't really seem to be the case. If we take some of the best demographic data out there in hunter-gatherers as kind of a, a, a key, obviously living hunter-gatherers are not the same as our, our, our ancestors, but it's the closest thing we have to try to understand what life and uh, mortality might be like without all the modern amenities. And so in hunter-gatherers, where the average life expectancy at birth is in the either high 20s or low 30s compared to what we're used to in the US and other uh, first world countries, there's a dramatic difference. But if you notice, this is the ratio of the mortality in hunter-gatherers to say the American mortality. And it's quite high, the difference, but most of those differences are early in life. And that by the time you get to say age 15, the mortality differences drop from say 200 early in life to 14 times higher in hunter-gatherers to about age 40, seven times higher in hunter-gatherers. And by age 60, that mortality difference is only three times higher. Now, so if you live past this early period of high mortality and you survive to age 15, the modal age of adult death is actually ranges from 68 to 78 in these hunter-gatherer populations. So it's not probably the case that the absence of older people is why we don't see these types of problems presenting these kinds of populations. So I wanted to move beyond mortality and actually look at living bodies to see, well, okay, do people actually have some more direct evidence? And so since I mentioned, uh, since 1999, we've been working in central lowland Bolivia uh, with the Chimane, so again, a horticulturalist population that share many similarities with hunter-gatherers. Their fertility is quite high. Their fairly high pathogen load. Most of their diet, if not all of their diet, is basically coming from the land, from fish, from, from their fields, and also uh, from wild game. And so taking advantage of the French government donating a, a 16-slice uh, CT scanner, it, it just a you know, mere 10 hours and several days in a canoe uh, away, uh, we brought people to the CT scanner to get a more direct measure of uh, atherosclerosis through looking at coronary uh, arterial calcification uh, based on thoracic CT scans. And what we found, so using the exact same methods for scoring as uh, in US studies, when we compared Americans uh, to the Chimane, it actually turns out that, well, the Chimane, so these are here in red, there is evidence of atherosclerosis, of, of calcification, but the lowers are much, the levels are much lower than what we see in the US. Now the MESA, this is the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. These are asymptomatic people without heart disease or diabetes that uh, are in the sample. So compared to those, the levels of, of the percentage of people with any calcification is much, much lower. Uh, and in fact, the Chimani reach a level that the Americans have that's a gap of over 20, 25 years. And so one easier way of thinking about this than this kind of obscure calcification scoring uh, is what's called the arterial age. And this is basically what uh, age, based on your, your, the CAC score you have, what's that the equivalent of someone in the MESA study? And compared to uh, what you would expect based on just the calcification score, the, the Chimani show evidence that basically estimated arterial ages that are about 20, 25 years younger than their chronological age. But the great thing about working with living people, if the story ended there, we might say, well, look, just like we found with the mummies, there's atherosclerosis in the Chimane. But here, the clinical findings really suggest minimal manifestations of atherosclerosis. So over the past decade, we found minimal obesity, hypertension, cigarette smoking, moderate high physical activity, uh, low uh, cholesterol levels, low, uh, your, your bad, your low density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol, low blood glu glucose. So all the risk factors are, are fairly minimal. Uh, and then if we actually look based on EKGs, if we look for evidence of past infarcts, um, over 1,100 EKGs we've looked at of people uh, 40 and up, um, maybe one case of an infarct looked at by our team of cardiologists uh, and even that, uh, some people, a couple of the cardiologists think is dubious. Um, and also based on other evidence with EKGs and also with um, uh, ultrasound, uh, evidence of preserved systolic and diastolic function. Uh, and it's not the case that 
uh, the young people that have these conditions then are dying at early ages, uh, or that these people have high case fatality rates. So based on verbal autopsies, over the past 15 years, we don't see very much evidence at all. In fact, maybe one case of someone who may have died of a heart attack. So it really doesn't seem like there's evidence of mortality selection that is explaining these differences away. Now, this is in spite of the fact, you know, they have some protective factors, but they also have very high levels of inflammation. Uh, and, you know, in the past 20 years or so, it's well known that inflammation is a major risk factor. In fact, it's a fundamental to the process of what we know about atherosclerosis. And by a number of biomarkers, uh, C-reactive protein is one many of you might be familiar with because you often get it done at your own, by your own clinician. They have very high levels and cumulative levels over their life course, uh, the levels that would basically associate with having heart disease uh, in, amongst ourselves. They also have low levels of uh, the high density low, low, uh, lipoproteins are, are good cholesterol. So a few take home messages uh, for the larger biomedical field. Uh, first of all, it doesn't seem like the inflammation story uh, is, is very complete, that the, the same kind of risk factor might not exert the same types of effects everywhere. And we probably would not have known that if we didn't look uh, at populations that are, I guess, uh, as Katie brought up, looking at non-weird populations, um, and particularly populations that experience lots of infection and have very different uh, kind of lifestyles than we have. And in fact, not only do they have high levels of inflammation, but biomarkers of inflammation are either unrelated or in some ways oppositely uh, associated with uh, our measures of uh, arterial calcification and other uh, indicators of atherosclerosis. And it could be that uh, inflammation that we experience from cigarette smoking, from obesity, uh, so-called sterile inflammation might have different effects than inflammation that is induced under the conditions more representative of the past, which would be more from infection. But also that other types of infections, particularly helminths, uh, are, these are our intestinal worms, our old friends, that we've carried with us for long, long periods of our evolutionary history, that they exert regulatory effects on the immune system and also anti-inflammatory effects that uh, might perhaps protect against the otherwise destructive effects of inflammation. And the other take home is that what we consider average you know, might not be really normal. Uh, so James O'Keefe, uh, a physician uh, back in the early 2000s, you know, argued the case based on uh, randomized placebo-controlled studies uh, with statins, that if you looked at the chronic uh, LDL levels uh, and you looked at a whole bunch of things, this is just a decrease over time in the, the, the luminal diameter, so the interior of the, of the artery, um, but you could change the y-axis and make it you know, heart attacks and uh, other cardiac events that when you actually looked at the, how the occurrence of these things in relation to the chronic LDL levels, it, it seemed to be a somewhat linear relationship to the point where if you draw the line that you would expect to get almost zero events. Uh, and this in this particular graph, it would mean basically a slowing of atherosclerosis to the point of stopping uh, at a level of about 70 or just less than 70. And so they were arguing in a series of papers that the optimal LDL should be something between 50 to 70, uh, whereas your typical recommendations, at least up until 2013, when the, uh, the statin-based uh, recommendations changed so that we're not reaching a target level, but it used to be that 100 was a level. But it actually turns out there's a decent amount of heart attacks in the region between 70 to, to 100. And this is just from the Chimane, but if we looked at other populations, it would be a similar case. The distribution of the LDL here in the Chimane compared to Americans, and it might be a little hard, sorry, for, to see the numbers, but the, the, the mode and the average there is, is about 70 for the Chimane, whereas about 85% of Americans have LDL higher than that. Uh, and that what's yellow there is in that 70 to 100, uh, region that basically many of Americans would fall into even if they were uh, taking statins. So uh, at less than 70 is a hunter-gatherer level of, of LDL that might be more extreme, but probably very difficult for us as omnivores uh, to reach unless perhaps you're, you're taking statins. So just to summarize and conclude, you know, atherosclerosis is present just like 
we observed in the mummies, but it's less pervasive than we see in the West. So certain features of cardiovascular aging may be universal. So you might see some calcifications and stiffening under the arteries. Uh, there's some you know, declines, you know, they might be delayed in systolic and diastolic function, uh, but they occur nonetheless. Yet the clinical manifestations, so whether it's heart attacks, hypertension, uh, peripheral arterial disease, strokes, that those themselves may not be universal and were likely very rare throughout human evolutionary history, uh, despite the fact that we can observe calcifications um, in these mummies. And also I think it behooves us to revisit common risk factors, uh, that inflammation might be high in hunter-gatherer populations, but immune function might be better regulated uh, in a very different environment, particularly in a presence of a more diverse set of pathogens. And it also raises the question of what is normal? You know, what are the target levels of different biomarkers like LDL that we should be reaching? Uh, and what might they have been like over the course of evolutionary history? And to take advantage of the fact, if we hadn't looked at a population like the Chimane, you know, these non-weird populations, that we can actually learn quite a bit about uh, our own health in, in say, the US um, by focusing on people that are more likely to have certain types of infections that could be cardioprotective. Uh, even a lot of our standard uh, model organisms uh, in the lab are infection-free, and so there might be some limitations of what can be gained. Uh, and also taking advantage of the fact, well, and the, and the horror of the fact that all in indigenous populations around the world are in different states of, of flux. And so it's a kind of quasi-natural laboratory for looking at the changes in lifestyle and environment on how that shapes increases in type 2 diabetes risk and in heart disease. Um, and so it's sort of untapped territory that very, uh, in fact, I don't know any uh, biomedically oriented folks that are, are working in these populations to, to try to learn more about the underlying etiology. And so for the future, you know, I think one thing, a take home message is if, if, if the story was just that, look, exercise more, eat well, don't smoke, uh, we already knew, those are your standard Framingham study kind of risk factors. Uh, and I think you know, those do make a big difference, but also you know, regulated immune function in the presence of certain parasites might also have some protective aspects on the heart, and that maybe in the future we might see that the hygiene hypothesis, uh, this idea that you know, we are not exposed to the same type of, 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 of critters as we would have in the past, that not only helps explain autoimmune type diseases in, currently, but also maybe extended to heart disease. Thank you very much for your time.